Um, so my name is Noah Gokul. I use they, them pronouns. I'm the program coordinator at IDA. I'm also moderating tonight um, for our panel, Rejuvenating Our Practice, Redefining Care. And um, we're just gonna go into a, a few slides um, to kind of ground us tonight. So you can do the next slide. So for our um, event tonight, we are recording this event and we'll be sharing the recording with anonymized, you know, removing faces and names and recording will only be shared with those who registered for this event. And as people are starting to do already, feel free to use the chat to engage with one another. Um, we have our community agreements that we use from Ida that will apply to the chat. And, you know, we might not be able to engage with everyone in the chat, um, but we do save it and your questions uh, to try to engage with them after the event. So uh, our tech person tonight is Jesse, and uh, they are reached by Jesse Ida Tech. If you have any questions or challenges with tech, feel free to message them. Um, you can also email our email at the bottom here, contact Ida uh, slash nyc.org for other questions. Next slide. Um, for accessibility, we have um, two lovely ASL interpreters joining us today. So um, we, we offer that. We also are offering closed captioning. So, uh, you know, if you want closed captioning, you can click that at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can also toggle between speaker and gallery view during the session. Next slide. So um, who we are. So this event is by the Institute for Development of Human Arts. And we are a community of current slash prior mental health service users, survivors, psychiatrists, psychologists, and other clinicians, activists, artists, who come together to transform mental health care. What we do is advance critical, effective, scalable alternative approaches to mental health through collaborative education and community development. And we're unique because we integrate experiential and academic knowledge. We challenge the idea that only those who work in the fields of mental health are the experts, and we're shifting power dynamics in a system that generally only privileges professional expertise and experience. So for our community agreements uh, that we, we like to share for all our events, uh, these are shared expertise and wisdom that everyone really brings their own expertise to the conversation. So really tuning into everyone's expertise, collective liberation, that overcoming oppression aids everyone's liberation, and listen like allies, that we want to respect all of the different uh, choices and perspectives. And even if we disagree with them, we don't judge or invalidate other people's experiences. Um, also, um, I wanna ground everyone in at IDA, what we talk about is transformative mental health. Um, and this is the, the lens that we employ. And this is also what this panel is really inspired by is um, informed uh, you know, by transformative mental health. So. Um, at Ida, we talk about this idea as a practice of personal and collective healing rooted in systemic change that, um, you know, there, there's a, an importance of really having a consciousness of all of the intersecting systems of oppression and, they, and their impact on our uh, bodies, minds, and communities. We also really place such an importance on experiential knowledge at IDA. Um, our lived and embodied experiences are the most powerful form of knowledge creation. And all of our trainings, best practices are really you know, informed by direct collaboration with those most impacted. And also lastly, holistic care, 
really uplifting voices and frameworks that bring us fuller understanding of mental health, that healing is a creative process and really wanting to address the whole person and the broader societal context. So that's what we talk about when we talk about transformative mental health. And this conversation tonight is part of a series of talks called Transformative Mental Health Talks. And tonight we are um, doing our event called Rejuvenating Our Practice, Redefining Care. So um, I'm just gonna speak a, a few moments about our event and ground us. Um, you can take off the slides now. Thank you so much, Malka. And just going to briefly share about our event. So um, we are in our co in conversation tonight with um, a wonderful panel of activists, survivors, and providers who are sharing how they practice a transformative mental health approach to mental health. Um, panelists will be sharing how they foster community to bring about positive change in and outside the system and really instilling these intentions of justice, choice, collectivity, liberation into their work. Um, they share the, the ways that they've found healing outside the formal mental health care system to really impart wisdom for those working within it. And so we really intend this event to uh, kindle hope and connection that you're not alone and that you can be part of a wider movement for change. And this event, like I was saying, is part of a new talk series inspired by Ida's Transformative Mental Health core curriculum. And it features its faculty diving into timely topics, interacting with transformative mental health. So um, I'm gonna keep it brief. I'm really, really excited to hear from our panelists tonight. Um, I think that, you know, this conversation is so needed because, um, you know, for myself as a, a peer who was working in the system, I, I felt so disillusioned by, you know, some of the problems I was seeing. They weren't um, given a lot of choice or voice. Um, different approaches weren't centered. And I felt like I was really complicit in, um, you know, a, a system that wasn't um, giving a lot of choice and, and wasn't built for the healing and transformation I wanted to see. So um, I'm so glad to be part of Ida and to be having conversations with the folks that are, are here tonight. So um, without further ado, I will welcome them to um, introduce themselves one by one. Um, so yeah, each of the panelists will have uh, four minutes and you can just introduce your name, your pronouns, a brief visual description. And then um, after respond to the following prompt, what roles and relationships to mental health do you hold and how do they shape how you show up to this conversation today? So um, if you don't mind starting, I will pass it off to Vesper to, to kick us off. Hello, y'all. Uh, my name is Vesper Moore. I use they, a, a pronouns. Um, I am a brown indigenous person. Um, I'm wearing a white t-shirt with uh, Geronimo on it, uh, also known as Ga Ya Kli, uh, the leader of the Bendong Kohe. Um, band in the Apache lands of New Mexico. Like a gray curtain next to me, I have a lemon tree behind me and a gourd mask of my ancestors. Um, what brings me to this space is a wide variety of things. I am a psychiatric survivor. I'm a mad person. Um, I would say a lot of my life experiences and a lot of the things that have brought me here today um, are really what contextualize that experience. Uh, but as well to that other roles, um, I am in this space too as an activist that is really looking to um, between, between abolition and, 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 and what policies that actually do serve us and rights that we do have in the United States, um, continue to do the work that, that is needed for our community, our people. Um, 
I would say that there's a lot of lineages with that when you are a survivor, um, when you do have these experiences. And I'd say that I come from lineages of many different movements, movements for disability justice, movements for mad liberation, movements around um, housing and racial justice, movements around so many different things. Um, so it's great to be here with y'all. Thank you so much, Vesper. And uh, you reminded me that I, I didn't do a, a visual description. So um, I am a brown non-binary person of color with long black hair. I have a green sweater and behind me in my background, I have a white wall with um, some pictures behind it. Um, so then I will pass it to, who is next on my, uh, Ji Yun. I'm gonna pass it to Ji Yun to introduce themselves. Hello, hello. My name is Ji Yun. I use they, she pronouns. I am a East Asian femme. I am wearing glasses and a baby blue tank top, sitting in a big office chair. I've got a mirror to the side, a, a plant, and some art in the background on a, against a white wall. Um, firstly, I want to locate myself. Um, I am currently zooming in from Manila, Philippines. Um, I was born in Puchan, Korea. And I am usually, uh, I grew up on and I'm usually resided in so-called Vancouver, Canada, on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. Um, yeah. So I am coming into this space uh, mainly in two parts, but more uh, for one, I am also a psychiatric survivor with lived experiences of uh, mental illness, madness, and mandated hospitalization. Um, I am also coming into the space as a justice-oriented therapist-ish, which I will get more into. Um, and I predominantly work with QT BIPOC, uh, sick and disabled folks as well. And I think I navigate mental health between that tension um, as someone with lived experience, but also as a practitioner who is expected to uphold a lot of the um, carceral practices of the industry. Um, and then on top of that, I think my relationship to mental health is obviously shaped by my relationship to power. And so showing up as a queer, currently non-disabled, um, Korean femme, immigrant, and settler on Turtle Island um, as a non-Black, non-Indigenous person as well on Turtle Island. Um, all of those pieces shape my relationship to the mental health industry and the carcerality of the industry as well. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. Such a well-spoken, articulate answer for 6 a.m. or whatever <laughs> early time zone. But yeah, super appreciate your presence here, G, on at, at such an early hour. Um, I will pass to uh, Caroline to introduce herself. Thank you so much, and thanks, G, on. Um, my name is Caroline Moswell Carlton, and um, I am a white person with uh, long, dark hair, but she's got some white streaks in it now. And um, I am sitting in a very nondescript hotel room, motel, <laughs> that I arrived in a couple hours ago. Um, but I'm excited because this means I'm facilitating a training for new Hearing Voices Network um, facilitators this week. Um, so um, the pronouns that I'm going to use um, for this space are she, her. Um, but I do want to share that beyond being 
a, a voice here, someone who hears voices. Um, I'm also someone with parts. Um, I identify as plural or multiple. Um, maybe you've heard people describe um, themselves as a system before. Um, so for me, there would be times when I would use another name um, and another pronoun. And so, you know, we're going to be talking a lot about community tonight. And I guess I just want to start by acknowledging the community inside, um, the community inside all of us um, that contains these different parts and experiences and emotions. And yeah, there are people that identify as bigender, pangender um, due to this experience. And, you know, I, that's something I celebrate and just want to share that integration is not the goal for all of us. And that's okay. <laughs> that's totally um, okay. We need a world that honors that type of diversity as well. Um, so I've worked in, you know, I first encountered the mental health system um, at the age of eight. So I do identify as a psychiatric survivor, but I also began working in the system at the age of 26. Um, so I've sort of seen both sides and I've worked in a number of environments, um, private, from private hospitals to like state funded community support teams. Um, and I currently work for the Wildflower Alliance, um, you know, doing peer support in a variety of settings and education. I guess for me, like the truth of my work is just, just like we are kind of like breaking apart the binary of gender, also breaking apart those binaries of the sick versus the well, the helpers versus the helped. Um, I think there's people harmed on both sides of those really strict binaries. And so if there's like one thread in my work, it's less about a role and it's less about a place, um, but making more room um, and busting apart like some of those limitations. And um, I'm just really excited to be here as we kind of like grapple with those ideas and whether helper versus helped really makes sense. Um, or if most of us fall, like need to fall in both categories to live full lives. Thank you so much. Welcome to the community of Caroline. And um, yeah, and finally we have Jax. Uh, would you mind introducing yourself? I would be happy to. <clears throat> Hi there, I'm Jax McNamara. My pronouns are they and he, and I am on the land of Ogapoge, known colonially as Santa Fe, New Mexico, but originally the land of the Tewa people. And um, I am a person of Northern European descent with a tan and dark brown hair, and I'm in my art studio. So behind me, there's lots of very intricate and very colorful paintings, mostly on wood. Um, and in terms of the roles and relationships to mental health that I hold, I mean, fundamentally, I start out as someone with a lot of lived experience and, you know, many diagnoses all across the board. These days, I identify most with bipolar as a framework um, and also as a trauma survivor. And those experiences led me to co-found the Icarus Project many years ago, which was a radical mental health and mutual aid project that spread all around the world and now it's known as the fireweed collective and so those years as an organizer with the icarus project have deeply shaped who i am and how i relate to mental health in terms of trying to find more liberatory and complex frameworks for understanding why people struggle and really fighting against the reductionistic thinking of the western medical model 
Um, eventually in my own healing process, I decided that I wanted to help other people in their healing processes. So I trained for three years with generative somatics in a somatics and trauma practitioner program, and also did some training in internal family systems. And so I have a private practice as a trauma healing coach. Um, I mostly work with queer and trans survivors, although not exclusively. I see some straight folks if they're really rad. Um, I currently have some openings in my private practice. So if you're looking for someone, you should get in touch. But yeah, so I kind of walk both the roles of the practitioner and the peer, um, very much living it from the inside out every day, and then also helping midwife people through their own processes. Um, and I think that answered all the questions. So I think I'll stop there. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really honored to be here. Thank you. I'm super honored to be moderating this this panel. And yeah, I mean, I'm someone wrote in the chat, I'm mental health fan personing. And, you know, I, I definitely feel that. I'm yeah, I'm a fan of everyone here and their work. And these are all wonderful faculty from the transformative mental health core curriculum that we are just uh, launched enrollment for, which I'll be talking about later. But um, yeah, starting with the first question, um, coming back to this idea of transformative mental health that um, I was sharing the definition of earlier, um, I wanted to hear from everyone in the panel, uh, what does transformative mental health mean to you? And how do you practice it in your work or life? Um, so if anybody can, can start this question, if you feel compelled to. Transformative mental health for me uh, means a wide variety of things. So I think I think what's interesting is, is that when we talk about transformative mental health, I think people might think, oh, well, do you mean transforming the way these services are offered or doing this or that? And it's like, uh, partially, uh, if we wanted to not necessarily think of them as services, right, um, and change our relationship, right, to it. So I think it's really, it's transforming our relationship with the ideas what we often call health, health of the body, mind, right? Mental health. Um, and that, that transformation looks like a wide variety of things, uh, kind of like acknowledging community more expansively and the capacity for care and support that exists in communities inherently. So for me, transformative mental health means that it's transforming the narrative and transforming what it looks like in our society. I love that, Vesper. Um, I'll just add on to that a couple of thoughts. One of the things that comes up for me when I think about transformative mental health is I think about it as opposed to, for example, mental health recovery and the whole idea of recovery, which I think of as a word that is about going backwards. Like I'm going to recover some mythical time back when I was healthy. And that for a lot of us, A, that time never existed, especially if we came from oppressive or abusive situations. Um, and that whereas transformative for me creates a space where we can be moving towards something new rather than recovering something past. Um, and then in order to move towards something new, in order to be part of transformation, we're looking both at personal transformation and at social transformation. Like it's impossible to be a fully healthy human in a completely broken world. And so how do we engage with shaping the structures around us as we also engage with reshaping our own survival strategies? And where do we want to land, you know, if we're able to reshape some of our survival strategies? So those are just a couple thoughts. Yeah, um, thanks, Jax. I think I'll expand on that too of, um, I think I think about what is the normative, like mental health discourse and praxis, and at least in um, North, so-called North America and the Western psychology field and um I love what you said Jax about forward and not you know going back because the roots of the mental health industry at least as we know it today and the, and the 
is rooted in um, maintaining a lot of systemic oppression by creating what's considered normal or healthy, and then the deviance from that. And of course, those categories are raced and classed and gendered and all of those, all of those things. And so, um, yeah, I think if that's kind of the normative, if those are the norms of mental health that have been um, built, but also like perpetuated and upheld by the industry, for example, um, in the West, then transformative mental health is a way to transform even just those roots, I think, of how we um, experience mental health, both, you know, individually as well as collectively. Um, I also connect transformative mental health to transformative justice as well of, you know, and, and healing justice as well of, you know, how do we embody and practice and like, what, what do we need to practice differently or embody differently and heal through and work through in order to co-create more liberatory ways of relating with one another, with ourselves, and also in co-creating more liberatory, less harmful worlds. Um, and so that transformation doesn't happen just on a personal level, but also in community and on a collective level as well. Yeah, I really appreciate what you said, Gianna Bell, like looking at kind of the, what are the initial goals of the system versus the ones we want to hold now? Like, what is the system that we have? Is it about transformation really, or is it about maintaining the status quo? And I know for me, like some of the responses I received, like I remember a time I was hearing voices when someone called the police. Um, to me, it wasn't even just maintaining the status quo, it was protecting the status quo from me. <laughs> and um, that was a hard place to really grow and transform from, you know? And like, I remember other experiences I had in the system, like, I'm sure there's other people who've been on like 15 minute check where like to keep your, to keep yourself, to keep you from killing yourself, instead of looking at transforming your life, you know, a big guy with a clipboard and a flashlight comes in like while you're sleeping on that plastic mattress and shines like a flashlight in your face, um, which for me is like, you know, like a lot of voice hears, I'm a sexual abuse survivor. This did not help me transform. This kind of brought me back. Um, and so I think it's so important that like the people in this room kind of define this conversation because I think like there was a point I realized where in the system, um, that risk management was not the same thing as healing. Um, and I think every one of us is gonna confront that moment, right? Where it's like, what we're doing here is managing risk, but this hasn't actually given the space for someone to transform. Um, like I was just talking to someone this very day where they were not allowed to use a CPAP machine on a psychiatric unit because even though it gave them like so much, much needed sleep, because they said, you know, the risk management team thought that it would be a ligature risk. So this thing that would allow this healing sleep for this person, they weren't able to have access to because they were afraid that, you know, they would choke themselves with it. Um, so I think, you know, all of us are going to have these, we all have these incredible gifts that we can offer people in terms of like deep listening, presence, um, curiosity, um, 
And I think the transformative aspect is moving away from just a system that manages risk to allow us to try new things and take some risks in the spirit of transformation um, that acknowledges that suicidal thoughts are often a desire to be transformed. Um, you know, that um, allows us, you know, I'll just give one example, like from my practice now, um, that was never done in a risk management system, which is dialoguing with other people's voices and other people's parts. That was just never done. Um, you know, the the system of that I knew people were were terrified and just wanted to make voices go away versus trying to transform that relationship by speaking, trying to understand the needs. Um, and the message um, and work through um, the conflict between the voice and the voice here. So um, yeah, I think, you know, ultimately this is a conversation about where we are and where we wanna go. And for the young clinicians or the young you know, peer supporters in the room, like I think preparing ourselves for that moment <laughs> that, um, you know, there's going to be like, this might come to a head and like sticking as much as we can to that value of wanting to transform the situation versus like contain it. Yeah. Thank you so much for these beautiful answers. Um, and yeah, I just also love that they're also different. And I think it really shows just with this question of what is transformative mental mental health to you, um, you know, how many ways that can be answered and that they're all like we that there's a power in the the fact that they're all together and that we can hold all of these truths and ideas. Um, and that and that's what makes it strong. So really appreciating yeah, all of these different perspectives. Um, I had a I had a question for for Vesper um, particularly and um, you know for the for the rest of the panelists feel free to respond to what anybody else is saying or you know all of these questions can be responded to um, but I had a question for Vesper um, that really kind of threads with the uh, things that Caroline was speaking about um, you know these really dehumanizing things that happen in the system and uh, so my question is, in your experience, what role does the mental health system play in disconnecting people from their humanity? Um, and, and what is the role of mutuality and vulnerability in combating this dynamic? Um, yeah, I'm just thinking also about, you know, we, we sometimes think about like, the, the person, the service user, but also thinking about the provider with this question too. There's so much there. And I think, I think a good place to start is kind of overview. When you look at, I think people often refer to just the mental health system and then people think system and they think government and they think that, but it's actually, it's government and it's private industry, and it's how we categorize things in our society. And there's so many different pieces that are involved in that. Often I like to refer to it as the mental health industrial complex. Um, and the idea of an industrial complex uh, really comes from what we know today as modern capitalism in the United States, which is taking something that's from outside of the market that's naturally occurring and bringing it inside of the market. One of my one of the favorite examples that I have um, is actually from the book Surveillance Capitalism um, by Dr. Zuboff. And the example goes like this. If you take like plots of land and you bring them into the market and you turn them into real estate, right? If you take human connection and relationship and you bring that into the market and you turn that into a service. 
that includes every type of service. That includes clinical service, that includes peer support, that includes um, all types of human services. And I mean the professionalization of peer support. I don't mean how it naturally occurs in our community and how, how it's existed for thousands of years in many different spaces. Um, but that's that's kind of at the root of the disconnection. It's 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 the mass production of something to a large scale to offer it as a service, and it is changing our relationship right to that connection, being a consumer of the service, consuming the service as a product, um, and receiving the service from from a company of some type. And then sometimes we are the the the, the product, if you will, in that too, because our information can be bought and sold. Right, that is the whole a whole market of things that we've seen, such as the the crisis text line sharing information regarding suicide to a for-profit under the same umbrella. We see so many different examples of this. So unpacking all of that, which it's a lot to unpack, um, that, is, that is the starting point of where we see oppression and violation in human rights is really this idea of, okay, how can we take the liability off of the private corporations, government entities, um, and, and put the pressure back on communities, oppressed communities, um, they are, and then instead viewing them as the problem. Sometimes we call this carceral sanism, carceral ableism, um, but looking at it, I also want to say that that because we refer to it as, as carceral sanism or carceral ableism, that doesn't mean that because you don't identify or are a part of a disabled community, a mad community or another community that you are exempt from it, you are still very, very, very much impacted. Because when we talk about a system like this, it is contingent on the value of what your body mind, your body and mind as one phenomenon can produce for society. So whether if that's labor, whether if that's what you're paying into a system and what you're doing with a system, um, your value is, is, is contingent on that. I think what is most malicious when we talk about the mental health industrial complex is that it's posed from a position of help. Um, when in fact it is so objectifying and so dehumanizing that it is so important to recognize the impact of industry and how the idea of mental health service changes that for us and what that does to us as a society. That's not to say that it doesn't play an essential role and like help people. Like I'm, I'm not saying that about services, right? I'm saying that they can be life-saving and life-destroying and we have to contend with that as a society. Thank you so much, Vesper. Um, and I'm I'm curious. Can I add people... something? I just yeah, I, yeah. Or were, were you gonna ask? <laughs> I was gonna ask everybody else. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I love what Vesper said, and like, you know, I want to acknowledge because I'm seeing some in the chat. Like, you know, there's there's different systems, and we have different systems. You know, not everyone in their role, you know, is able to be as independent of the system, though I will say, you know, in, in Massachusetts, you know, we have some organizations like Wildflower Alliance and Kiva Center that get DMH funding, um, but do not have to do referrals or diagnostics or insurance and stuff. So there is, there is a middle ground. Um, but for me, like, I think every one of us, you know, cause I've sometimes like, I've, I've done work in like long-term forensic hospitals that are very like carceral environments. And for me, like a little harm reduction tweak that sort of keeps me in line with what Vesper is saying is taking off this lens of, I need to report this and instead thinking, I need to explore this. And that's just a really simple, it's like something that we can kind of hold on to in those moments where like we might be feeling that systemic pressure. 
like something simple that can like bring us back into our curiosity um so remembering like we're not law enforcement even though sometimes they try to put us in those roles but thinking like instead of I need to report this I need to explore this um take a few breaths and just you know go a little deeper into my curiosity and like hearing that person's story Uh, Jax, do you wanna do you wanna add to that? Yeah, I was just thinking about. I was looking back at this original question, and I was thinking about how does the mental health system disconnect providers from their humanity? Thinking about that side of it, I um I've attempted grad school for therapy twice, and I have lasted a quarter, <laughs> and couldn't handle it, and it was an intensely dehumanizing experience, um, just being forced to think about people in terms of diagnoses, discovering that even at a pretty like hippie out there therapy grad school, there was still this very strong sense among the students and the teachers of like an acceptable amount of mental health distress to have experienced. Like if you just had a, you know, kind of like an anxiety or depression diagnosis, that was cool. But if you had a diagnosis that was like bipolar, borderline, something on that side of things, which I did, that was not cool. People did not know how to handle the idea that you might be becoming a clinician, but you had been through serious extreme states. Um, and and it was really clear to me that to get through that that situation, I was going to have to like just kind of chop off part of my heart and do this huge disconnection dissociation process like I tried to make it through an abnormal psychology class that was a prereq at the community college and it was like just pulling fucking teeth and I couldn't do it I dropped out I ended up just being like this is this is totally intolerable I don't believe what's being taught here and I can't disconnect from my humanity long enough to pass this like one semester course <clears throat> and and it just really made me wonder like what, and this, and this was not like, you know, going to a psychiatry school at like a state college. This was like a hippie school and it was still totally intolerable. Um, yeah. Just how much are clinicians having to practice really intense forms of dissociation in order to remain in the field and in order not to fully acknowledge the humanity and the complexity of their patients. I'm going to say yeah. another thing, but super brief. I just wrote it in the chat because I think it's so important and it's actually covered in one of the sessions I do. So hope you'll check that out about suicide. Um, every one of us in our career is probably going to deal with a supervisor co-opting the language of mandated reporter law and saying you are a mandated reporter and saying that means that you are mandated by law to report someone's thoughts of suicide or other the fact they're hearing voices to a mental health agency this is not what mandated reporter law says <laughs> um mandated reporter law typically has to do with reporting abuse and neglect well always abuse and neglect usually of children but in some states it is um elders as well. Um, in some states like Massachusetts, it also includes people that are disabled and have a caregiver. So if their caregiver is abusing or neglecting them, reporting that to a relative, relevant like protective agency. Now, I'm not saying mandated reporter laws don't have their problems, but I think it's really important that we know what they say and they don't have anything to do with thoughts or feelings, reporting thoughts and feelings. So again, you may, you will, we've all gotten that pressure, but I just want to make sure it's clear that that pressure does not have the force of law behind it. Those are agency policies, you know, it, which is different than a law, even though sometimes they act like they're not. 
It's different. Thank you so much for uplifting that. That's a really important thing to share. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm hearing people respond to this. Um, and I, I, I saw that there are some, you know, mental health professionals here tonight. And, you know, by, by no mean are we, you know, trying to say, you know, throw that license away, just don't become a, you know, mental health professional, like, uh, we are, you know, are, are bringing everyone into this conversation. And, um, you know, I have a question for ji um, who, you know, you identify as, uh, you call yourself a therapist-ish, like you're kind of, you're, you know, in that sort of quote unquote provider role, but it's like, you, you kind of slant it, like you're like a little diverging. And so I'm curious what you mean when you say um, therapist-ish um, and how do you um, approach your work to really decenter um, industries of care, mental health care and cultivate community approaches? Mm, yeah, I could probably spend, I could probably write a whole book on just these two questions. Um, I, for one, I identify as someone who has had therapy, therapist trauma, like therapy trauma, like have been traumatized and harmed by mental health practitioners. And, and at the same time, I am, you know, a registered therapist, a professionalized mental health practitioner in so-called Canada. And so there are a lot of tensions there that I'm holding. Um, I think for one, just like I, for one, the normative therapist, there are, um, as what Vesper said, um, the commercialization of care further individualizes wellness and healing. Um, and it becomes this like situation where we pedestalize therapy and like, oh, don't talk to your friends about it. Go, go talk to a therapist. And like all of this care in terms of mental health, for example, is expected to come from this one professionalized practitioner who is unfortunately expected to and is um, uh, who has learned to, who is taught to be afraid of our clients um, of losing licenses, right? And therefore perpetuating a lot of these carceral practices of the industry. Um, and so I say therapist-ish because I don't even like saying that I'm a therapist. Like I technically, I, I am, you know, that is um, like a, the license that I got and that's the job that I do or rather like community role that I, that I play. Um, but I want to really blur what therapy is and is not and what a therapist should and should not do because there are many, many um, some explicit and some uh, not unspoken expectations around those divisions. Um, and so oftentimes something that comes up amongst practitioners is the code of ethics. And um, a lot of the code of ethics are like, cool, yes, um, this makes sense. Um, and a lot of, but, and at the same time, a lot of it is written under this illusion of protecting a client. However, oftentimes it's really to protect the industry as well. And therapists are taught to surveil and um, punish and pathologize and criminalize our client community members to maintain and uphold um, the, the norm. Um, and so something that I learned from, uh, uh, she's a social worker, um, professionalized social worker, indigenous femme named Jennifer Lee Coble. And she offered an, such wisdom where rather than feeling bound by these uh, rules, how can we stretch them? How might we be able to stretch them? And that felt so liberatory for me because um, yeah, there's what we're taught to fear, um, going, breaking the rules, right? And so this idea of stretching. Um, 
I also identify like it's actually like I identify as a therapist community member and then I actually refer to my clients as client community members and it's a mouthful but that's really important for me because I want I know that I have a relationship with client community members beyond our therapeutic therapy therapist client relationship um, like we're client we're community members first and foremost um, and so that I think opens up the possibilities of how might I be able to offer care and show support and be in so uh, solidarity with this person um, and at the same time I think it is still important to name the fact that we are you know in a therapist client relationship at the same time because that speaks to the power dynamics um, that are present and also the ways that I'm implicated in the mental health industrial complex. Um, but that is a framing that I've had of like, instead of thinking about how can I support this person as a, as a therapist, expanding on like, how are some creative and alternative ways that I can offer care and show up in solidarity for this person while considering um, both the social role and power that I have as a professionalized practitioner. Um, and so I can use that power and, you know, the, the power comes with um, having more access to particular resources. And it also speaks to the ways that I need to mitigate to reduce possibilities of perpetuating harm because of that power that I hold. Um, yeah, and so like really blending in peer support, mutual aid, um, collaborations. I've done um, collaborations with some client community members. I learned so much about disability justice from one person. And so we would do therapist therapy sessions, but I was doing a self-directed DJ course last year in the summer. And um, they, we, so we had DJ chats alongside our therapy sessions and we I like compensated them by just like trading um, those two offerings. I've also done mutual aid fundraisers for client community members for um, for indigenous folks especially whose like towns have been burned down from climate crisis and the wildfires um, having folks like do their own little section on indigenous wildflowers in my newsletters right there's so many ways to collaborate and um I believe that we're capable of communicating right of like communication and boundaries and like checking in of like how does this resonate and I've also had situations where I invite client community members into my kind of like social spaces because we're all trying to look for other queer Koreans, queer politicized Koreans, and it's such a small space. And it didn't feel good for me to have access to this community. And this person is so deeply looking for that and to not invite them, right? And so how do we work across, just like communicate and really centering that community members piece first and foremost, and then adding in, and then just, you know, mitigating and recognizing the how that might shape the therapist client relationship and in what ways could it actually you know make that blossom even more and in what ways might we want to kind of set some boundaries as needed so yeah I I'm now excited about being a therapist ish because there's so many possibilities of how we can relate with one another thank you so much and I really I really appreciate this language of of stretching um and I, I i i really like the way you shared um yeah all of these different ideas that providers could be implementing to create more of a collaborative approach um and yeah i think that you know when you go to school uh to get a license to become a mental health professional you you have to sort of abide to these 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 codes of conduct, these rules that are enforced by the institution, but then are providers taking a step back and really creating their own like code of conduct, their own kind of, you know, values that they want to live by, um, that they want to put into their practice. So I, I really was inspired by, by what you shared. And I'm curious from other people on the panel as well, um, if you have advice 
uh, for providers really wanting to, uh, who are seeking to make this kind of shift to really to stretch their, their uh, practice? I, I would just say a couple recommendations. Um, I, I, I would invite them to look at non-carceral frameworks um, and trainings. I think that's an important place to start. Um, I, I think a lot of a lot of professionals don't often understand the, the punitive nature of what they're often trained to do, operate within. Um, and some of the these histories, I talk about this a lot with, with with social workers. Like, there's an abolitionist network of social workers that's sharing non-carceral practice with each other. That's doing some pretty great work, um, and they're acknowledging the 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 civil rights movements that that led to some of that work, right? With with, with social work, but then you also see some of these histories with social work where they were taking away like white social workers were taking away black and brown children so so you have like a there's like this this dichotomy right of like oh you know there's like a idea of, of some liberatory practices being at the center of this but also oppressive roots it's like how do you acknowledge the oppressive roots apply that to the work you do now and a lot of other pieces so i would definitely center that Yeah, I really appreciate you naming those non-carceral pieces, Vesper. It's something that I've thought about a lot in my practice. I really appreciated, ji the ways that you brought up kind of how you can be both a therapist and a community member, client, community member, and, you know, <clears throat> what you can share in different domains, you know, and I think that's one place for me that kind of having a non-coercive, non-carceral approach where it shows up in my own practice. Like if I have a deeply suicidal client, for example, that I'm very, very worried about, often one of the first things I'll ask is, okay, who can we get in touch with in your life? You know, like, let's talk to your sibling. Let's talk to your cousin. Like, who are you close to? Who can we bring on board to be part of your safety team so that we're doing everything we can possibly do to keep you out of the hospital? Because I, you know, have a very solid commitment that I do not ever call the cops on my clients, period. Um, and I do not ever force treat any of my clients, period. <clears throat> and so if force treatment is off the table, then how do we handle crisis in ways that are collaborative, you know, and maybe look a little different than the boundaries that people get taught in therapy school in terms of who you're supposed to be talking to as somebody's practitioner, um, but that really keep people alive and, you know, make it so that they come out the other side of that crisis, not traumatized by the crisis itself you know, by the crisis response itself. Um, so yeah, I really appreciated those things. Yeah, I'm really loving this conversation too. And, you know, I think, Gian, you had used a phrase about like, like community, what was it? A, like a commun client community member. Yeah. And like one of the things that I've thought about before is like, how would our work change instead if we didn't view ourselves as like, oh, I have to fix everybody or I have to save everybody, but we just saw ourselves as community builders. Um, you know, I have this voice in my head that actually gives me really good advice sometimes. And she'll tell me, she'll call me Rivka, which is my Hebrew name. And she'll say, weave Rivka, weave. When I get really stressed out, when I feel like I have to like save everybody, because I have those moments, she'll tell me to weave, which I think, you know, means like weave people together, like, like build community because you can't do it all. And like, so I wonder like if we all just, use that lens of like, I'm a weaver, I'm a community builder, braiding. Yeah, I love that language in the, the chat, how that would change things. And I know like, you know, it can be hard and it can be hard, you know, Jack's, you know, talks about like how, you know, when someone is sitting in front of you and they're really struggling and, but you know, like, 
you know, that acute hospitalization is not going to make their community bigger and um, it might limit it. And we've seen the data of, that it doesn't reduce suicide rates. So what we what do we do? And I think some of those questions that Jack's offered are really important. Um, and, you know, some of the questions that I ask people is, you know, are is there ever a moment like, is, has there ever been a moment in the past week or month when you didn't feel like killing yourself? Was there ever a moment? Where were you? What were you doing in that moment? Who were you with? What were you listening to? How were you moving your body? Um, these are kind of the ways that we can sort of begin to find like the beginnings of that like tapestry, like connecting with what they're still connected to. Because I've found like everyone, you know, even someone that is like deeply, deeply suicidal, that can be a hundred percent true, but reality is multiple and they might be deeply, deeply suicidal in that moment. And they might really be looking forward to the next episode of RuPaul's Drag Race. And that's super true and important, or they might be working on a piece of art. Um, and like, that's something that as like weavers as community builders, um, we can kind of think of. And yeah, like, you know, I work with some very young people sometimes, sometimes 11 years old, the parents want them to avoid the system. Um, and so remember, like music can be a community, like, you know, what song, you know, are you playing on repeat right now? Or is there anyone on YouTube that ever describes how you feel? Um, we can start like community mindedness. We can, we can build it up, but yeah, it, it often involves like getting in touch with what are some of those little things that are still keeping this person alive? Yeah, I really love that you you came in with community. I don't know if you were like channeling the fact that I'm like about to ask you about this, Caroline, but I'm I was just gonna ask you a question um around this topic. Uh so one of your lessons in the core curriculum, you emphasize that the things that are most helpful for people um, to survive are relationships that are warm, curious, and compassionate, and a community where they have a purpose and a role. And so I was wondering if you could share um, what you've learned more about the power of community in this work, um, either for your your own personal experience or in the wider context of movement and um, collective healing work. I guess you're just like expanding on what you were just already sharing. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things I've learned like over the years, um, and it's tough because we have this system that wants to fix but like most of the people I talk to, they don't want to be fixed. They want to be loved. I mean, I'll say the L word. I'm not afraid to say it. They they want to be, you know, accepted um, for where they are, like in that moment. Um, and it's so hard because, yeah, sometimes the system says, oh, our job is to tell people what's wrong with them and tell them, you know, how they're supposed to change. But I've talked to many people, you know, folks kind of reach out to me, like, all from all over the world, like they might see an article, and they might send an email. Um, and sometimes I can talk to someone maybe for just 15 minutes about the fact that they are hearing voices. And like, often at the end of the call, they'll say like, oh, this, this has changed my life, but I haven't really done that much. I've just said like, you're not alone and there's nothing wrong with you. And there's other people like you. 
And like, that's all I've really said. Um, but it, you know, when I, I can only like, I can look back at my own life because sometimes like people will say like, your life used to look really different than, than the one you live now. Like what, what do you attribute that to? And so I, I think about it and like, you know, come, you know, I remember these moments, like I remember, you know, once I was in a psych ward for two and a half months, for two and a half months, they wouldn't let me leave. Um, and I just, I couldn't get any privileges, like I couldn't get like, any movement. But like, I remember on that psych ward, I was in there for like all these holidays. And someone asked me like, do you want to help light this menorah and light in quotation marks? Cause we weren't allowed to have matches or candles. It was like plastic you, outside a nurse's station, like screwing the bulb, but like somebody invited me and like, you know, someone said words in Hebrew, which they translated into English, which was essentially talking about this force in the universe that had kept us all alive to see that moment and like how like incredible that was and I remember like looking around and there's someone like literally in a back brace because she had thrown herself off of a bridge and it was like whoa like we are we're alive um to see this moment and I think for me like I've it was a huge, probably the most healing moment on that psych ward. Um, but I think what was so healing about it was it made me feel like I was a part of a wider story. Um, you know, Vesper talked about the importance of lineages um, because they give us a context before mental patient. And then they offer us like, you know, a pathway forward. Um, so I think, you know, and there's so many moments of my life, like, you know, the the staff person that took me to see a roller derby game um, and, you know, being allowed to become a part of that community, um, you know, getting to take care of animals. Like I was lucky I got to live on like a therapeutic farm and what I'll say is it was really the animals that did most of the therapy. Like animals can certainly be community too. So I just, I benefited like, you know, from all these moments where, um, you know, people allowed me to be a part of something larger. And I guess like, I, like, honestly, like, I can't remember like any of the CBT skills they taught me. Um, and I can't really remember like um, any of the DBT other than the ones she like took from like, I think Buddhism because later like I learned that's where most of it comes from. Um, but what I remember are like those moments where I felt like I had a reason to live. So it's like, it's less about like, oh, I need to give people skills um, and more like, I need to walk with them as they find their reason um, to be alive. Um, and um, there, there's one more thing. I, there's one little story I wanna share um, where <laughs> um, I once had someone call me and she was in a lot of distress. And, you know, we talked about what she was going through and all this stuff. And um, there was this moment where she said to me, you know, Caroline, you once said something that changed my life, that changed my life. Um, and I like started to think like, oh my God, like, what was it? oh, did I, you know, did I like give some amazing like coping strategy or like, what did I do? Did I drop some like pearl of wisdom? And I was like, 
you know, ready to hear like what I'd done. And um, what she said to me was, I was like, yeah, I'm just curious, like what, what that was. And what she said to me was, one time you logged in to the online hearing voices group and you said, oh my God, every time I log into this group, I'm terrified. I think something's going to go wrong. And I think the like Zoom is going to break down um, and I'm totally scared. And I guess I had said that out loud. I don't even remember saying it. But to her, it changed her life. And I think one of the reasons why was it made her feel that like she could have fear and still play a role in the community. Like she could be afraid. Like she could have like, these difficult experiences, but that she still could show up, that it wasn't about being fixed or perfect, um, that she could exist within it like as she was. I think that was fundamentally, you know, kind of what was being conveyed. And so I never forgot that. And it's another reason why like, you know, I think community and acceptance is so important. And like, you know, like my hope is that we can have more vulnerability all around, not just for like folks in peer roles, because that's how community becomes authentic. Yeah, uh, I I really love just all of your sharing about just this this idea of like authentic community where you can just show up as you are. Um, I'm curious for other people on the panel, if there are other, yeah, other things that this question brought up for you about really the power of, or of, of community in your own life um, or in the mental health work that you do and in, in becoming part of a movement for transforming mental health systems. Yeah, what do other people, um, does anybody have anything else to say about this? I think I just wanna note that I've learned like the word community. I mean, there's so many ideas around what that looks like, et cetera. And I think I've learned to, um, I've learned so much about community building as like, a series of skills and practices that we um, that we embody um, through disability justice, right? Like especially sick and disabled, QT BIPOC, where you can't rely on the institution and commercialized forms of, of care because of um, such intense carcerality. It's like we need to survive with each other. Right, we can't do this alone, and so I've learned so much from sick and disabled QT BIPOC around community building and care webs, right? Um, of how we support e- support one another, even when we're not likable, right? Of like you don't have to be likable to uh, receive to have your basic needs met, for example, right? And that's a big piece, and then in transformative justice as well of you know of like okay if we're not going to rely on these institutions um how do we keep each other accountable and how do we you know create safer spaces safer cultures um and and that is all about community building too and so yeah just want to do a little shout out and like pod mapping right so just a shout out to especially those the people who really um teach us so much especially black and indigenous folks um bipoc sick and disabled QT BIPOC um, in those spaces. I think community for me means a wide variety of things, but I think one such thing is, is uh, often community is the space that I can turn to when I don't feel very hopeful about what the future looks like or what we're going through. And I do think that there's this, uh, you know, going back to when we talk about the service system and a lot of these other pieces, there's a missing component of like, okay, let's, let's like take a moment and talk about how we're both feeling about the world right now, you know? Um, and I see this a lot too. It's like 
in industry and even in activist spaces, we always look at like the world is a big problem and we have to start from like a macro perspective and work our way down and do all of these things. And it's no, no, no. The world changes person to person in community spaces throughout, you know, um, there's so much wisdom that exists within communities. Um, and there's so much wisdom in our bodies too. Um, our bodies have the capacity to do so much emotional healing for each other and um, for ourselves. So I think, I think often going back to that industrialization piece, we lose sight of all of that. And we lose sight of examples like Caroline's and uh, Ji Yun's about like what community can truly do for us, right? We put this, there's like this place of like hierarchy of like, only the professionals know, only the authorities know, right? And community truly does dismantle that idea and uh, bring the power back to all of us. And I think one thing I just wanted to add because like Vesper made me think of it, um, like, you know, when we when we talk about um, capitalism, too, I think we need to discuss how that has made community more difficult in many ways. Um, this pressure to always be producing um, people lacking, you know, the the inequity um, makes it really difficult for people to have time to just sit and be together. And I know there was, you know, in the mental health system, when we look at the history, you know, there was a time when it was like, oh, the best thing we can do for someone is to help them find a job, help them find a job. And it was really like anything like, you know, making widgets for Jeff Bezos in a factory, like working for like, big corporations um and I think like I hope what I mean I think a lot of this is coming through but I just want to restate that community um is often separate from notions of productivity like all the things that I remember like those transformative moments like you know the roller derby team that accepted me like that wasn't a job um, but it was still a place where I felt valued that it was okay to be strange. Um, you know, many of the behaviors that got me called a borderline personality were actually celebrated in this particular community. Um, so, um, you know, it's, ab I think it's really important to look not only about the fact that a job isn't doesn't necessarily mean community for everyone and that sometimes overemphasizing the work role and the work identity can even like cause harm in us building community Yeah, I think that's a really important point that you just made, Caroline, um, you know, because people who are joining on this call who are providers or working in the mental health system, um, you know, there's a lot of different ways to approach uh, working in that environment and doesn't necessarily mean that you have to, you know, make that your whole identity, right? Um, and we've talked a lot about that tonight. Um, but how are we, you know, caring for our individual selves as well um, and in community so that we can show up in the way that we want to in, in this sort of stretched way? Um, and so I have a question for, for Jax on this. Uh, so, you know, when we are trying to move beyond these sort of individualized, um, just solely medicalized approaches, to mental health, uh, it really requires these uh, a, an expansion of our toolkits. And I've heard you talk about, you know, having toolkits you've developed um, 
as a trauma healing coach, facilitator, and educator, how have you developed your toolkit? Um, what practices, resources, and networks have aided that journey? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I'm trying to decide whether to answer it first from a personal level or whether to answer it from more of a professional level. Um, I think I'll start from the personal level because that's where my journey started. Um, you know, I think like a lot of us who get thrown into the system young, the version of my toolkit that I was handed by psychiatry and Western mental health was drugs, that my toolkit was drugs. And, you know, maybe the other part of my toolkit was like, if I couldn't sleep, call my psychiatrist so he could give me more drugs. Um, and it became pretty clear to me at a young age that that, <clears throat> that was a wildly insufficient toolkit for actually living as a human. And I've spent a lot of time being like, what else can go in my toolkit, you know? So, um, and that's was one of the things when we started the Icarus Project all those years ago that was so important to us was helping people build out their toolkits. So like, is it food that you need to pay attention to? You know, like I know now that if I'm starting to get manic, it's really helpful for me to eat food that's really grounding, like sweet potatoes and things that come out of the earth. <clears throat> like that's a part of my toolkit, you know? is exercise a part of my toolkit, you know, especially if I'm getting depressed, are there ways to get my body moving, even if it's super minor, even if it's just like going for a walk around the block with my dog, because that's all my depressed ass can handle doing. But like, are there ways to bring, you know, exercise into the toolkit? Um, are there ways to bring different embodiment practices into that toolkit? And sometimes an embodiment practice for me just looks like taking a really hot shower. Like when I say embodiment practice, I don't, necessarily mean it has to be something like now it's time to go do 30 minutes of yoga and have tremendous self-discipline you know a lot of us when we're not super well don't have access to the parts of our brains that can do 30 minutes of yoga um so sometimes it's just like i'm dissociated and i can't feel my body i'm going to take a hot shower and until i can actually feel the edges of my body again and remember that i'm alive you know so being really flexible about what goes in your toolkit. You know, one of the things I think about that goes in the toolkit is who do you call? Who are your support people? Like something that I often do with my clients is I have them make, I call it a crisis cheat sheet. And so it's just one piece of paper of what you can do if you feel like you're going to lose your shit. And we try not to put too many things on that piece of paper. It's not like the whole toolkit. It's not trying to be comprehensive and overwhelming. It's like, you know, I am going down the vortex and I need to stop. What can I do if I'm going down the vortex? Okay, I can call or text one of these three people. I can go take a hot or cold shower, depending on the person. You know, I can pet an animal. It'll release oxytocin and help me be able to think again, you know. If somebody has a rescue med that works for them, like Ativan or Zyprexa, you know, whatever they might be using, or if they have a rescue herb or a rescue flower essence, but something that's kind of like, I'm pushing the panic button, I'm going to put this down the hatch, that might go in the crisis cheat sheet, and that might be it. And so the idea with the crisis cheat sheet is just like, this is what's going to get them to a place where they can kind of think again where they have access to more thoughts and more options. And then maybe once they're in that place, you know, they can start to be like, I should probably reach out to my therapist or like, you know, whatever might be the next thing that is helpful to them. Um, but really trying to build out a sense of having choices, having choices that don't just involve Western medical professionals, um, having choices that are really accessible. And, um, yeah, I don't know, there's so much I can say on this, you know, and then sometimes with people, I also work on building out a toolkit that is kind of bigger and more robust. So beyond just the crisis cheat sheet, it might be more of a mapping tool like T-Maps um, or like RAP for people who use that tool. I generally use T-Maps with folks. And so T-Maps, we build out a much bigger sense of like, what are my warning signs when I'm slipping off the tracks? You know, what helps me get back on the tracks, the track I want to be on, not the like 
capitalist Western idea of like being a productive worker, but whatever somebody's own idea of health is, what helps me get back on the track for that, for my idea of health? Um, like really building self-awareness and building a sense of what's possible. Um, and I use this tool. I mean, I use those kinds of tools for myself and have for many years. Um, oh, thanks, Jesse, for putting the link in the chat for TMAPs. Um, but I also use them with my clients all the time. And they also become a tool when you write all this stuff down. A, it's a great place to have really good conversations with whoever you're writing it down with. B, it becomes something you can share with your support people. So you can share it with your friends, you can share it with your therapist, you can share it with your family, whoever you actually trust that you want to be kind of an intimate part of your pod helping to hold you. And then they have more information about what you go through, what that looks like, how you respond to it. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, those tools are really, really useful. Um, and then I'll say that as a practitioner, just because we have a lot of providers on this call as well, like I've been pretty strategic about educating myself about what are tools that I can use with my clients that are going to give them some concrete skills. So for example, I took a little class in the resilience toolkit that has some very basic somatic practices just around like breathing practices, just different kind of nervous system regulation practices. Um, and I use the resilience toolkit with my clients all the time and just teach them these really simple, basic practices that they can bring on board <clears throat> when they can tell like, oh, I'm really dysregulated. How do I get back inside myself? Okay, let's do settling breath. Here we go. You know, or whatever the different practice might be. So like I've learned things from the resilience toolkit I've studied IFS quite a bit and parts work I find incredibly helpful and I educate pretty much all my clients about parts and the idea that they probably have parts running the show a lot of the time and that whatever I could do a whole webinar on that so I won't go super into it I'll just say parts work and IFS are super useful and then also the tools from my training in generative somatics um, has also given me a lot of tools, you know, some of which are tools that are more like a thing you do with your provider, not necessarily on your own, but some of which are like just really simple grounding practices that you can absolutely do on your own at home. And I encourage my clients to work with. Um, so I could go on and on, but I think that's probably enough. So I think I'm going to pause there. Um, I would love to add just a briefly to that of um, another person that I learn a lot from. His name is Travis Heath, and he's a practitioner, um, a mixed race practitioner who I've learned a lot around uh, abolitionist therapy. And he reminded us in a offering of his that um, like Western psychology, the industry has only existed for like 100, 150 years healing and care has existed since the beginning of time and so to really get creative again of like how did our ancestors how have our people healed across all of these generations right and even when we think about those tools I think I know for me I've been like what other extra training do I have to do like all these other extra credentials I haven't done them <laughs> I haven't done them I know like my ancestors have healing practices, right? My community members, my other kin have healing practices that they've been passed down through their families and ancestors. There's so much wealth in culture and in our ancestries and our communities and just in our creativity. Um, Travis is, um, he talks in a YouTube teaching called Radicalizing Psychotherapy. Um, he talks about how with a client, they were talking about gardening. They literally freaking brought soil into the client session and like touched soil together. You know, like there's so many creative and you don't need to get uh, extra training and whatever to do that. Um, so there's so much creative. There are so many creative ways of doing that. And you don't need all these extra trainings or you don't need to feel like you have to do all these trainings to expand the tools that you're either doing for yourselves or um, offering to, to client community members. And I would like to just add to that as well, uh, just in terms of uh, ancestral healing practices and a lot of those pieces. Uh, 
for for myself, the experience of hearing voices, seeing visions and other encounters in my tribe is described as like, those experiences are very much a part of you because you are your ancestor because your ancestor is a reverberation from generations back. Uh, so often in my practice, like, like, like for myself, I pray to my ancestors every day. And when I pray to my ancestors, um, that practice within itself, usually I am talking to voices. I am in, in engaging in, in things that, that people would be like, why, why would that make you feel well? You know, like putting aloe on my face and in my hair and taking long breaks and long pauses like that, right? Um, what does that do for you? You know, so uh, I, think, I think there's a lot, again, it, it depends on like what, what is perceived as healthy, right? It's not always perceived as healthy to talk to a voice, to, to engage in these ways. Um, when in fact, for, for our tribe, our people, it's very healthy to do that, so. I would also, I think this is a really important conversation. And I would also add that, you know, we need those of us that have white privilege and walk through this world, you know, with this mantle of whiteness. I think it's also really important that we too um, look at who we were um, before, you know, whiteness gave us access to a lot of academic power or, you know, I'm the one who's grappling with the DSM um, in, um, you know, one of these modules here in the course. And yes, it is white people that are mostly responsible for this document. But I think it's, it's also very important as white folks to also do, do the time um, to look into, you know, what the truths our ancestors held before, you know, um, you know, the scientific method, before we laid claim to truth in that way, before we laid claim to, um, you know, defining what was normal. Um, I think that's a really important practice. And what I'll add to, um, is, you know, also when you're doing this, like, I think it's good to look at um, pre-Christian um, to go to take some depth um, time. And um, I know, you know, for me, this has been like a really fulfilling process because, you know, I am currently like studying with like a rabbinic seminary and we're like studying, you um, you know, mystical texts and finding that, you know, there are meditation techniques, you know, within this own, our own tradition, um, sound healing, and also the idea that the human experience is multiple. Um, a lot of us come from cultures where the idea that, that there's just one reality and someone in power gets to define it using the scientific method, the one truth that, you know, is not, is not the, the ways of our ancestors. That's a pretty modern idea. So I think doing some of that work, um, and I know it can be, be hard sometimes because yes, some, some of us come from traditions where there have been genocides and such, but I think it's really worthwhile in doing and will help us expand our mind in terms of like what healing truly is. Uh, thank you for that that addition, Caroline, to, to look at your ancestors and invitation for white folks to look at your ancestors. Um, and yeah, really also what people are saying on this panel of that, you know, it's not just the toolkit for the client, it's really for everyone provider. When you develop your own toolkit, you're able to collaborate with the, the person you're working with, the person you're supporting with in a deeper way, because you're just in tune with yourself. You're in tune with, 
you know, the, the support that you need. Um, yeah. So really, really thoughtful answers and suggestions. Um, I have a question for everyone. Um, and this is coming back to transformative mental health. Um, so I, I'm really, you know, just wanting to leave people with this feeling, you know, um, that, that there's more, there's more and, and that they can be part of this. Um, so when you think about transformative mental health landscape or ecosystem, what really excites you the most at this moment? What is igniting your hope? Um, so yeah, feel free to, to jump in, um, anyone. So much is igniting my hope in terms of expansive resistance that I'm seeing in more civil rights movements and just among people in general. More people are identifying as neurodivergent, more people are identifying as mad, more people are looking to see what these, these, these terms mean and what these experiences mean because they've only known the traditional mental health system and they've had these experiences and they're like, wow, that was extremely awful um can I like 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 what what can I do for myself is there more out there so people are asking that question a lot and I think I think the great thing for for us as a community and in, in a lot of regards is that is that 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 is going to lead to a culture shift of how we view all of these things it might not happen now it might not happen in the next couple of years but it's it's coming, uh, the seeds are planted and they are sprouting. I think for me, um, I mean, a lot of things are igniting hope, but I'm really inspired by the work of the disability justice movement in particular, and just the ways that people are thinking through things like care work, like Leah Lakshmi Pyepshna Samarsinga, and just the ways people are figuring out how to build care networks and really be there for each other on profound levels, I think is really inspiring. To sound old, I'm really inspired by people younger than me and the shit that they are up to right now. Like people in their 20s, <clears throat> like Project Let's and Stephanie and just people who are doing really incredible visionary work and yeah have a much wider perspective than like I did back in my 20s when I was doing similar kinds of work um, also Ida gives me a lot of hope for me Ida is really one of the beacons in the movement and I'm not just saying that to like be flattering but it really is I look at what you're putting out there and how you're doing it in terms of the kinds of spaces you hold the attention to who is present the attention to like race dynamics the attention to ASL support and just all the ways that Ida is trying to hold these extremely intentional spaces for transformative mental health. And I find it deeply, deeply hopeful. Yeah, I, I think for me, there's so, there's so much, um, so many things I'm seeing that I certainly didn't see like 15, 20 years ago, just a couple examples. Um, you know, in Massachusetts, we have a few, and I think they're popping up elsewhere, true alternatives to the police, like community responder teams that are really independent of law enforcement. It's been great to work with some of those as they develop their own identity um, and just you know, we're doing something that doesn't involve someone with a uniform, a badge and a gun. And that's, that's taken so many years of like advocacy and work to make happen. And um, it's really exciting. Um, it gives me a lot of hope, you know, to be just a small part of that. Um, doing more work with families too. Um we recently got this grant through like the attorney generals to work with families um, and sort of like, you know, stop just having like this idea that there's like the, the sick person and the family and fix that person, but really work, um, you know, with that like sort of ecosystem of the family. 
But um, I guess what gives me the most hope is just increased vulnerability. Like, I'll just give a shout out. I was doing a training recently and we were talking about a lot of this stuff. We were talking about like, you know, how risk assessment tools don't work. Acute hospitalization isn't great. Like we were talking about all these new kind of responses uh, we could try for people who are feeling suicidal. And I had like a provider in that training just get really real and say, on an intellectual level, everything you're saying makes sense. It all like completely makes sense. And, you know, I'm on board intellectually, but like emotionally, like I feel this block. I feel this block. And I just, I loved her honesty in that moment because it felt like if we can get there, then we can just, we can start to just get fucking honest about the fear that a lot of us are holding. And we can just start to get honest about like control and how sometimes we're pressured to be able to control things that like we literally can't control. Like I can't sit on a person and like keep them alive. Like, and if I did, like, I don't know what kind of life would that be, but like learning to feel and name the fear, but then also work with it. Learning to kind of let go of like these ideas of, I need to control this situation, let that go. And then just try to connect instead. And I think this is like emotional work that all of us will have to do in every single role, um, not just in the mental health system, but I think like in our society. Um, and I just, it's those moments where people are willing to go a little bit deeper and like say the thing out loud. <laughs> When I turned 30, which was quite a while ago at this point, you know, I made this vow to myself that I was just going to start to say the thing out loud that was like true, but like no one really, everyone was kind of afraid to say it, but it was like, you know, this is kind of what's going on. And like, I feel like, I don't know, the next generations, like the coming generations are just really modeling that. Um, and yeah, like I just have these incredible moments where I get to see vulnerability, where I get to sit down with like, kind of like boomer dads, like my own, that are kind of like my own dad, but we talk about feelings. I remember like we got with one guy, he uncovered the fact that his problem with his son's voices is that he's jealous that his son talks to the voices and not to him. And we like cried together. And it was like, that's that's the stuff right there um, that gives me kind of hope for like a more tender connected world. Oof, I love that. Um, I am excited for dreaming. I'm excited for spaces and practices of dreaming and co-envisioning and co-creating. Um, Ida being one of them, interrupting criminalizations beyond do no harm, being another one, and also just connecting with um, practitioners, friends through social media has its downs, but also I've met a lot of incredible people through it too, of um, just dreaming together, co-envisioning and co-creating together. You think um, oftentimes I've, oh, or, or let me, I'll readjust and say Talila, Talila A. Lewis, who works at the intersection of abolition and disability justice. Talila, um, I can't remember the quote, but Talila basically said something along the lines of the, one of the biggest gifts of the most marginalized is their dream work. And that dream work is so, so crucial and central that we are orienting towards something of like nonviolence or anti-violence is not the goal for me, actually. It's, it's liberatory, pleasure, ease, whatever, 
like the feel good being together interconnected loving that's the goal for me and so for us to be able to hold and address the harms that are currently happening and do that deconstruction work but also to do the dreaming and co-creating in community together as well and to have specific spaces where people come together and they're like let's create the space to dream together um I see a deepening practice or or I'm more exposed to I'm exposed to more and more spaces and people who are dreaming these days um so that's what's really exciting for me thank you all and I'm gonna sound cheesy I don't care but you all are bringing me hope you know, just by your presence in this world. So thank you for, for being here. Um, and yeah, in just a minute, we're going to hear from each of the panelists um, briefly talking about their role as faculty in the um, core curriculum. And so if you connected to this uh, conversation tonight, then this uh, curriculum that Ida just launched uh, enrollment for is really another space for you to dream um, collectively with us. So I'm just gonna um, briefly share about this uh, offering that we just um, created. Um, so the transformative mental health core curriculum, it's now um, enrolling. And uh, this, this is a curriculum that we intend uh, for a primary audience of mental health providers and care workers. Uh, so social workers, psychologists, counselors, therapists, through specialists and nurses. Um, but also we invite so many other people who interact with this work. Um, you know, this could also totally apply to all of these other identities, uh, academics, researchers, educators, artists, activists, organizers, family members. It features uh, 48 faculty, uh, such as the wonderful people you met tonight from across the country and world that are bringing their lived experience and uh, research and professional experience. Um, and then we have two formats for this curriculum where you can join in a learning cohort to move through this experience together. Um, so you can really collectively dream with people and move through it together um, in these virtual discussions. And then we also have a self-paced format where you can move through all of these um, eight modules at once, uh, working through at your own leisure. And then um, it's a 20 hour, there's 20 hour plus of content. There's a ton of resources and, and things to, to dive into. Um, and we're offering the curriculum for um, a lot of different options for people to really increase access and choice. Um, so we have six different options from $99 to $899 and higher and lower access to wealth um, uh, options for people. And uh, next slide, please. And this is just a um, amazing compilation of all of the, the, the faculty here and you probably recognize some of them. Um, next slide. And these are uh, some of the modules for the curriculum. Um, so there's eight modules and these are the first four. And then these are the next four. And uh, we also um, are very pleased to offer CE credits for the curriculum. Um, so you can get uh, 20.75 CE credits for all um, uh, psychologists, social workers, counselors, therapists, medical doctors, and nurses. Um, and then also peer specialists are um, able to get, New York uh, peer specialists are able to get CE, 23 CE credits as a no cost add on as well. Um, so I just wanted to invite uh, Ji Yun, who um, is a, a faculty member, uh, to just briefly share about um, their lesson in the curriculum. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. So psychiatric abolition, this lesson is an expansion on just abolitionist discourse and praxis that I learned from Black and Indigenous folks on Turtle Island. So I expand on how car psychiatry, carceral psychiatry is an extension of the prison industrial complex and implicating mental health providers, professionalized practitioners as well as an expansion of that. Um, and I'll go into like a brief history of how that came to be, as well as what it means for practitioners to be implicated in the system and some um, ideas of how we can move forward when we're in the system. Thank you. And the next um, faculty, I'll invite Caroline to just briefly share about the lessons that you did. Yeah. Um... So um, my first one that I did is redefining language. Um, you know, one thing I've learned from my ancestral tradition is our words create worlds. Our words create worlds and our words have the ability to expand the world of people that we encounter, but also limit it and close it down. So um, we're going to be exploring like what that looks like in practice with redefining language. Um, then we're gonna um, grapple with, uh, you know, the big boy, the DSM. Um, and we're going to talk, expand our discussion on language. But also we're going to talk a little bit about Western taxonomy in there, the the Western um, sort of practice of putting things in discrete categories. We're also going to talk about pathology too. Ultimately, all of us for are going to have to grapple with the DSM. I know either, you know, I've received labels from it, but it's something that we should encounter with with background knowledge and wisdom and and handle carefully. So please join me for this grappling session. Um, and then finally, um, I did a section. Um, there's a lot of great information about suicide in the course. Um, the session that I'm doing, it's kind of towards the end, I think, of like, what do we actually say um, to someone who's feeling um, suicidal? And then what are some things we might shift our paradigm away from saying? So um, yeah, hope you'll join me for some of these. Thank you, Caroline. And um, yeah, Jax, if you don't mind just sharing a few uh, sentences about your lessons. Sure, I'd be happy to. So I'm in the dangerous gifts and extreme states section of the curriculum. Um, my first lesson I do with Sasha de Brule, and it's talking about the history of the Icarus Project. So yeah, all the way back to the beginning of why and how we founded it and the impact that it has had in the world. And then the second one, I think, is the exploring extreme states. And so I look at a lot of different frameworks for how you can understand the kinds of the kinds of extreme states that often get labels like psychosis or mania or bipolar. <clears throat> but what are ways that we can understand those states as realistic reactions to the downfall of the climate crisis or like, you know, reactions to trauma or just like what are all these different non-pathologizing, non-coercive frameworks for why people go into extreme states? And then the third lesson is caring for extreme states. And in that lesson, I bring up some of the stuff I talked about earlier around toolkits um, of just like what, what are the different toolkits we can have and how can we approach an extreme state? And if you're a practitioner, how can you help your client to make meaning out of the states they go through um, and learn how to navigate them with more grace and ease? So yeah, that's kind of what I do. Thank you, Jax. And Vesper, if you uh, would share just a few about, you have a lot of lessons, but here are some of your lessons. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's it was it was a lot. I want to first say it was it was wonderful to to train and to teach with Ida, and and I and I want to like really encourage y'all if 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 you aren't signed up 
for, for, for some of these trainings to check them out and to please share, please share as widely and as vastly as you can. Um, so one lesson that, 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 that we kind of start with here is nothing about us without us. Um, I talk about the roots of that term in South Africa. I talk about its connection and its legacies in many different civil rights movements, but particularly its connection when we talk about the consumer survivor, ex-patient, ex-inmate movement, mad pride movements, anti-psychiatry movements like abolition movements, so on and so forth. And with that, we talk about a lot of those different connections. And specifically, when we talk about the histories of resistance, we get into Mad Pride a bit. And we do talk about um, the, the early Icarus project, now known as the Fireweed Collective, a little bit with that idea of dangerous gifts. So I think it does tie in nicely there. But it does also, you know, we, we talk about what does it mean to reclaim mad as an identity, um, as a socio-political identity? What does that look like? Um, how do we move through the world? And why is it so important? Um, you know, often I, I like to say that madness and being mad is about subverting that paradigm, but why is that important, right? So we talk a little bit about that. Um, and then we get into the consumer survivor, ex-patient, ex-inmate movement, and we talk about the histories of resistance, um, including a few uh, civ acts of civil disobedience, but also the, the movements and groups that were forming across the United States and across the world, really. Um, and then with that, we kind of then coast into uh, mad liberation. And what does that concept look like? What does it actually look like to liberate our body minds um, from a carceral mental health system and the mental health industrial complex? How does it look? What does liberation look like when we're trying to, to free our, ourselves of something that we are actively in? every day in one shape or another. Um, and then also kind of moving beyond systems, envisioning a future, right? Um, that is based in communities that is led by, by folks that are most impacted. Thank you, Vesper. And each one of these lessons by these faculty is absolutely incredible. Um, yeah, so I'm just gonna share a few more about the curriculum. We have a virtual info session on September 28th. If you want to learn uh, more about the curriculum and ask any questions you have, uh, there's a link in the chat to enroll. And you can also ask any questions to our email here. Um, next slide. And then uh, for enrollment for the curriculum, the kickoff date for everyone is October 15th. So for our learning experience um, format, which is the learning together in a cohort, uh, there's limited seats that are available for that. So definitely recommend you enroll early. Um, it's uh, about halfway full for both two, uh, for both cohorts currently. So it's filling up um, and uh, the registration will close on the 13th of October. And also for self-paced, the enrollment is not capped. So you can um, feel free to enroll at any time. And you can visit this link to, uh, to enroll. Um, and we also offer scholarships and you know, we're, we're making a, you know, this accessible as possible. Um, so for follow-up for this event, just wanted to uh, make sure you know that you know, you can share your feedback about this event in a form in the chat. And then also we'll have the event recording and a uh, closed caption transcript and the event feedback form. And we'll have some of the, the resources that were shared tonight as well. Um, so I think that's, is, my, is that my last slide? Oh, no, it's not. Um, so you can become an IDA member as well to grow and, uh, you know, become part of this community of, of mental health change. Um, so, you know, if you want to become part of this, uh, you can join this way. And uh, we also have the link in the chat to become an IDA member. And next slide. And also, um, here is some of our social media links uh, to stay in touch with Ida, to get more connected to us. We hope that you stay connected.
All right. Well, I want to thank all of these amazing panelists for all of that you shared tonight. Um, I'm feeling super hopeful and fired up. And I hope that people stay connected to us, whether it is becoming a member, uh, joining us with the core curriculum, or joining us in another conversation like this tonight. Please, please stay connected. Um, we are stronger together in this movement for change. And I also want to thank our wonderful um, staff, the Ida Tech team for tonight, and our wonderful, wonderful interpreters, ASL interpreters. Thank you so much. And for everyone who joined tonight, please have a wonderful night and take care of yourself. And we'll see you soon.